Hello, everyone, and welcome to the most out of your podcast, how to distribute and monetize your content. I'm Sarah Schultz and I will be your moderator. I create content on YouTube and Instagram, mostly focusing about fashion and self love. And I also launched a podcast independently last year called Sierra Unfiltered. So not only am I super excited to be here guiding the conversation, but also just really stoked for the opportunity to learn from our amazing panelists that we have here today who have just so much knowledge and experience that they are here and ready to share with all of us. So I will go ahead and introduce our panelists. We'll hear a bit from them and then we'll just get right into it. So first up, we have Mike Muni, who leads podcast creator partnerships at Spotify, where he and his team spearhead overall strategy and operations for how the platform works with independent creators. Mike, thank you so much for being here. Of course, thanks for having me, Sierra. I'm excited to, uh, to talk to you all about podcasts. We are excited to have you here. Awesome. We also have Rebecca Steinberg, who is a content development manager at ACAST, the podcast company with a network of more than 10,000 shows. And she leads the West Coast acquisitions, helping creators use podcasting to bring life and diversity, stories and experiences. Hi, everyone. I'm really excited to be here today. I actually have a, a background in video world, um, so quite familiar with this space and, and looking forward to chatting. We are so excited to have you here, Rebecca. Thank you for being here. And our last panelist is Stephen Perlstein, who is the Vice President of Podcasts at Studio 71, where he oversees all the aspects of podcast distribution, creative, and monetization. Hi, Stephen. How are you? Sierra, I'm great. I'm excited to be talking about all aspects of podcasts with the hundreds of thousands of people watching live right now. <laughs> Yep, we've got a, a packed virtual house here, um, and I'm just super excited to get right into this with all of you. Podcasts are such a huge emerging market that's really growing quickly, and many creators like myself are just trying to find their footing and make their podcast idea a reality. And there's great opportunities in podcasts, not only to create a new rev revenue stream, but also to connect deeper with your audience through that long form, more unfiltered content. So let's go ahead and start by talking about monetization. So I'm gonna direct the questions at you individually, but panelists, please feel free to jump in and add anything that you want to each of these questions. So let's go ahead and start with Rebecca. Rebecca, what are the different types of monetization for podcasts? I just dropped something on the floor right before I was about to speak. Um, so. Yeah, so, um, you know, our company is quite advanced in terms of what we can offer when it comes to advertising. Um, ACAST actually pioneered dynamic insertion technology. Um, it's the tech that allows you to insert ads into an entire catalog um, so that you're never served an old, stale ad. Um, just like when you watch reruns of Seinfeld, if any of you do watch reruns out there, you're not getting served a commercial from the 90s. You're going to see something relevant and fresh, something featuring a brand of today. Um, so this is how we run all of our advertisements. Um, we traffic fresh ads into old episodes to capitalize on listens happening when people discover your podcast for the first time. Um, and, you know, the advertising world has evolved so much. Um, you know, in the podcast space. And while host read ads are super effective, there's also a lot of opportunity for more turnkey advertising where ads can be placed across collections of shows and targeted by market. Um, so, you know, this is a way to, to see multiple revenue streams coming through from various territories. Right now we can actually run ads in over 13 markets. So it's really exciting. Um, you know, we're also looking at alternative streams of revenue from branded content to branded segments um, and packaging up podcasts along social for a more 360 approach to advertising. Um, but at the end of the day, we're a podcast first company. This panel is about podcasting. Um, but I do think it's important to be nimble here, especially as the landscape shifts, as more celebrity talent are getting into the space, as more creator talent are getting into the space with multiple channels and multiple platforms that we can kind of weave into these creative campaigns. 
That is great. That was, I think, so important for creators to, to understand the different types and the dynamic ads as well. What monetization streams do you think are best for a creator who's either just launching a brand new podcast or has a smaller podcast? Um, so, you know, as I mentioned before, um, I would highly consider our, that podcasters uh, use programmatic ads as a means to driving revenue for their podcast at the outset. Um, so even if you're a, part, a podcaster just starting out, you can still monetize this way by being included alongside podcasts that have built-in audiences. Um, so at Acast, we have a self-serve platform called Acast Open, where you can host your podcast for free, and we also recently enabled advertising um, if you do want to run ads on your show upon launch. Um, when it comes to more personal host read ads, though, I'd say be patient. You'll get there. Um, focus on growing your audience and the advertising piece will come. Make sure your show stands out. Identify your purpose. Work on building your audience. As you connect with your audience, as they share with their friends, as they share with their family, your listens will inherently grow and the revenue will come. So it's a long day game. It doesn't happen right away. But if you put in the time and effort, the revenue will come. Absolutely. Great advice, Rebecca. We just got an audience question in. So Steven, I think this is a great one for you to answer with your expertise. So what um, are the benefits and drawbacks of doing a video podcast versus an audio podcast? And does that change at all the, the advertising revenue? Yeah, for sure. I think one thing that's really great to keep in mind for creators like yourself, Sierra, uh, who have an existing YouTube channel to tap into their audience there, right? Uh, our philosophy at Studio 71 is always pretty simple, right? Meet the audience where they are. So if they're watching your videos on YouTube and they like being there, then I think that's a great place to distribute a podcast. Not every advertiser or maybe monetization partner works very easily to say, sell ads into the video, right? Um, but that's where somebody like Acast or Megaphone or Anchor can come in with those dynamic advertisings that were mentioned in podcasts that get downloaded into audio. And just for everybody, I, I think it's clear, but I'll, I'll jump in and add it. A dynamic advertising or programmatic advertising that works a lot like those YouTube pre-roll ads that everybody's familiar with or those midstream ads. Exact same thing, but for podcasting. Uh, and now these platforms like Acast, Megaphone, even Anchor are really advanced these days and make sure the ads get inserted in a great spot for an ad to go. Um, the benefit for advertisers though is they think if it, it's a video, they're getting more listens to their ads. And so they like that. That means you can sell at a higher rate and make a little bit more money. I think one of the downsides is uh, the, let's say YouTube algorithm that everybody uh, chats about is maybe a little bit less friendly than a pure podcast subscriber, right? When you get somebody to subscribe to your podcast, they don't really go away. They don't need to turn on notifications or hit the bell or hit like to make sure the things get surfaced right back up to them. They're subscribed to you and they're gonna get all of your episodes. Um, so I, I think that one of the things to keep in mind if you're doing video is to still try to hold on to subscribers on the audio platform as much as you can. Great advice. Thank you so much, Stephen. One follow-up question I had from that is you talked a little bit about meeting your audience where you're at if you're a creator who has an existing, existing audience. Do you think it's best for a creator to launch a new channel on that platform or a new page on that platform for the podcast or to post it in their existing social media channels? This is a great question and the subject of much debate at Studio 71. <laughs> we talk about this all the time. Um, you know, Personally, I'm a podcast guy. I've been a podcast for 10 years now, uh, and I love the space. I'm still trying to fully understand how the YouTube of it all works. I would say that I would definitely experiment with releasing your podcast on your primary or main channel just to see how it goes. Um, some people will find that that affects their algorithm a little too much, and they're hurting kind of the core business that they have. It's Studio 71, when we have that happen, we're like, no, 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 let's start a second channel. Let's figure out how to optimize and drive, drive traffic there. Like that's totally okay. Other creators, that won't really happen and you'll get just as much, if not more engagement because of your podcast. Uh, and then I say, hey, enjoy, you got the best of both worlds. <laughs> great advice, great insight. One last question for you, Stephen, before we move into talking about distribution. As a podcast grows and a show grows, they're gaining viewers, they're gaining momentum, 
how can a creator scale the monetization and the income from their podcasts? And are there more monetization factors that come into play as the podcast grows? Yeah, I've been lucky enough to work with a lot of different podcasters throughout my career from people who have really small audiences of, you know, maybe a hundred subscribers to people with uh, a million listeners every episode. And that's really fun and crazy for its own set of reasons. Uh, I think the one thing I would say is there's there's constantly opportunities to get more money with monetizing with an audience, whether that's through Patreons. Um, if you have a really dedicated fan base, your, your audience likes to support you. And I think that that's a great way to look into it. I think offering you know, bonus episodes or some sort of bonus content really works well. So if you can maybe double up on the number of episodes you're doing, one totally free that goes out into the world, one behind the Patreon, that's a great way to build a revenue stream. And some people are pulling significant money there. There's programmatic advertising, which I mentioned before. I think that's a great opportunity to monetize your back catalog. Um, there's host red ads, it becomes live events, which are so much fun and a great way to monetize. You could partner with a brand to put on a live event. Uh, the list of ways to get into it really goes on. Uh, but I think at a certain point, I personally believe in partnering with an advertising partner because it gets a little tricky, you know, like there's so many options to get into and so many uh, brands that are out there. Focus on your business of making the great po the greatest podcast you can and let somebody else worry about all the silly ways that you can make money and get your get the most out of it. Yeah. Absolutely. Those are super important things for creators to think about as their podcast is growing and expanding. Let's go ahead and kick it to Mike to talk a little bit about distribution. So Mike, once a creator has come up with their concept and they start recording their podcast, they're all ready to go. How do they go about actually getting it out there? Sure. It's a really great question and, and a really important one. Uh, it first starts with uh, choosing a hosting platform. If you don't know what a hosting platform is, that is actually the storage and delivery of the audio files to make up your podcast. So you'd upload those to a hosting platform and then a hosting platform would generate an RSS feed. And that RSS feed is what's going to distribute the podcast to multiple platforms. Um, most hosting platforms will allow you to distribute directly to Spotify. Uh, and some you have to take an extra step and actually go to our website, podcasters.spotify.com which is actually our one-stop shop for podcast creators. It provides uh, analytics, um, your creator portal, notifications for when you get featured on podcast playlists or when you're charting. And all you have to do is go there and actually just drop your RSS feed in. Uh, and I believe that we actually have a video on Spotify for podcasters if we want to go ahead and share that now. Amazing. Let's roll it. You already know how to tell a great story. Stories that draw listeners in, spark a debate, make people laugh, or maybe even freak them out. Whatever story you're telling, we're here to help your podcast grow. Welcome to Spotify for Podcasters. Submit your podcast to Spotify and share it with millions of listeners in over 75 countries, no matter how they're tuning in. Meet your listeners and followers, learn more about who they are, and even what music they like, so you can understand your audience and pitch to sponsors. See how people respond to your episodes, which ones they enjoy, where and how they listen, and when they tune in, or so now, so you can make each episode better than the one before. Reach a world of new listeners, pull their attention, and watch your followers grow. And then you can focus on telling the great stories only you can tell. This is Spotify for Podcasters. Awesome. Cool. That is um, so cool. <laughs> yeah, it's a really awesome platform. Um, I will also call out that we just released a new video series called The Input, um, which has an entire episode about how you can distribute your podcast. Uh, and it is a cartoon that actually features me uh, inexplicably as a farmer. Uh, so definitely <laughs> check that out as well. Yeah, make sure you guys check that out. I think it, from that video, it seems like you guys are offering some really cool tools for creators and analytics and lots of cool stuff going on with Spotify. So uh, I'm going to do the next question for Rebecca. So Rebecca, when a creator is getting ready to choose a hosting platform, what kind of things should they look for? Um, so, you know, as you know, there are 
tons of different podcast player apps out there um, that people can download to their phone. Um, so make sure that the hosting partner you're choosing distributes everywhere, as, as Mike alluded to. Um, the consumer really should have a choice, and I do firmly believe in an open ecosystem and meeting your listeners where they are, as, as Stephen said. Um, so look for a partner that is IAB 2.0 certified, um, which is very technical, but what it means is that the tech has been vetted by the bureau that sets the standard for advertising in the industry. Um, and so this will ensure that your analytics are really spot on. I think that's really important, especially when it comes to enticing brands to work with you down the road. Um, in terms of analytics, look for a host that provides robust data, data uh, gender breakdowns when possible, location breakdowns, a company that has a global presence so that you can approach the podcast, podcast ecosystem um, from a global perspective, and look for a partner who is genuinely interested in your content, um, not just interested in your following, um, someone who is going to help you and who's going to be there and who's going to be able to facilitate cross promotions for you and help with PR and signal boosting. All of this is so important. Um, and then of course, you know, look for a sales team who has a proven track record when it comes to connecting partners with the right brands. So I think if you look at it from a holistic perspective, sales, content strategy, PR, marketing support and sales, um, then you're likely kind of heading in the right direction. That is all such great advice. I feel like I need to write that down with my pen and paper right here. But it is it is so true that that data is so valuable for creators because once you have that, that's what you can pitch to brands. That's how you can show brands, hey, look how engaged our audience, look who our demographic is. Um, Steven, when it comes to marketing your podcast, gaining new listeners, how do creators do that? What's the best practice for that? Man, that is the literal million dollar question. Uh, I would say the thing to keep in mind, again, for creators like yourself is meet that audience where they are. Um, you know, I think it's always better to engage people as much as you possibly can uh, with your content. So when you're posting on social media, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, uh, I know this sounds silly and maybe a little bit counterintuitive, but I say spoil your podcast. Tell people what the literal best part of your episode was. Um, I tend to find that listeners don't uh, avoid podcasts because, oh, they told me what a really good part of it was. They may go, actually, I really want to listen and subscribe. The other thing that's maybe cheap and easy and effective to do, maybe the most effective thing you can do is become a member of the podcast community, guest on other podcasts, um, find, uh, find people who do similar content to you and see like, hey, maybe we can be guesting on each other's podcast. Uh, and and my, my little, my personal tip or trick for it is go on and be the most you you can possibly be. Um, don't worry about trying to, you know, fit into the format or be filtered or do, you know, any of the things that you feel like you need to do, sell yourself to that audience. And if they like you, they'll come over to your podcast or invite them into your real genuine self, which Sierra, I listened to a handful of episodes to your podcast. And I think you do a great job of that. Uh, hope the podcast comes back. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm actually in the podcast room right now. So it is a little nostalgic. <laughs> But that is great advice, snaps for that. Being genuine is something that will never go out of style and that your audience will really connect with. Uh, let's do the next question for Mike. So if a creator already has an audience on another platform, whether it's YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, how can they drive that existing audience to become a podcast listener? It's a great question. Um, and something that interestingly we've seen uh, a lot of podcasts that do really well on Spotify come out of the digital creator community because they're utilizing those other platforms so effectively and our audience tends to skew younger than our listening platforms. So some of that same audience is usually on Spotify as well. If you look at our charts, uh, you'll see they actually look a lot different than our listening platforms because that audience skews younger. So this is something I definitely encourage all creators to do. Um, I would say that you guys as creators know your audiences best. You know exactly how to utilize those platforms in order to push to your podcast. Um, I will also call out that Spotify has really clean social platform integrations. You've probably seen the one on Instagram stories where you could post directly to stories a piece of content, whether it be uh, you know an album you're listening to, a podcast. Um, I tell partners to utilize that feature all the time 
because we see that it really helps to drive audience uh, to your podcast on platform. Yeah, absolutely. I think using all those tools to drive to social media is so, so important for gaining that podcast audience. Let's talk a little bit about podcast networks. So Mike, at Spotify, you work with a lot of independent creators. What are mm -hmm. some of the benefits of a creator being independent? You know, it really depends on what makes most sense for you as a creator and kind of where you are in as your life cycle as a podcast creator. Um, the good news is that there are so many players in the podcast ecosystem right now, and they all have different offerings for creators that it's pretty easy that if you decide that you want to partner with the network uh, to find ones that serve the needs that will essentially move your goals forward as a creator, whether it is you need help with monetization, you need help with production. Um, it's never been a better time to be a podcast creator. Uh, and obviously with any kind of partnership, you know, there are gives and gets, and it just kind of depends on what makes the most sense for you um, and whether or not you want to, you know, build that business completely independently uh, or you kind of want some help to scale some of those support functions. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's super important to consider whenever you're thinking about signing with a network. Rebecca, working with ACAST, you and your team provide a lot of resources and support to your podcasts. So what are some of the benefits of working with a podcast network? Um, you know, so from my perspective, um, networks are able to really provide a lot of guidance to partners. We know what works, we know what doesn't, we get tens of hundreds of pitches a month to review. Um, so we can really help you kind of restructure your format so that it's viable long term. Um, but additionally, a network can activate in many more ways, you know, provide cross promotion opportunities, um, as I mentioned before, uh, be it a verbal endorsement when one podcast endorses another. Um, we can run promos for your show across our network, across our platform. We can facilitate guest opportunities um, where one host appears on another podcast and vice versa, so they can borrow each other's audiences, essentially. Um, you know, additionally, a network will likely have deep relationships with other streaming platforms like Apple, like Spotify, like iHeart, Stitcher. We can pitch your shows to these platforms for features, which is a great way to find new listeners. Um, and then, of course, when a network has a sales team um, that really understands the podcast ecosystem and has deep relationships with brands, we can help you create a sustainable business, which I think everyone is ultimately looking for. Um, you know, I work with a lot of creators um, on developing and, developing and launching new shows, um, many creators who have big followings. At the end of the day, it's really about sculpting creative um, that is unique and that is specific to them that they're really passionate about. Um, and, you know, a network can help you strategize and figure out what concept is going to have a long shelf life. Um, and, you know, one thing I'll note is that you can work with a, with a platform like Acast and still be independent. Um, you don't have to share your IP. You can fully own your work. Um, and it's, you know, really just um, everyone grows and everyone kind of prospers because as listens go up, revenue increases and everyone kind of, you know, can take a piece of the pie. Um, so that's really what we're sharing in here. Absolutely. It sounds like you guys have a really great system going on with ACAST and with your podcast creators. Steven, working with Studio 71, if a creator partners with you guys for their podcast, what does a partnership usually look like? Yeah, well, Studio 71, again, I think works a lot on the philosophy philosophy that I mentioned before, which is we want to meet our creators where they're at. So we can do and do a bunch of different services for our podcast, whether that means somebody wants to come into our studio uh, and record with us, whether that means maybe they just want some help on the post-production side. Uh, we can just distribute the podcast, just sell it, just promote it. We can kind of work in a number of ways. We want to, we want to work with the podcasters in what makes sense for them. Um, you asked a question and I sort of just started talking and I was like, this is my preamble and I was going to get to it. I forgot. What no, it no was. problem. I was just asking, what does a partnership usually look like with Studio 71? And that's, yes, exactly. So I was just said, it can be a lot of things. 
ultimately it's exactly like Rebecca described is we're try we typically work on an ad revenue split. Our goal then is to be very aligned with you and help you grow your revenue as much as possible. So our revenue can grow, grow as much as possible. Um, and all the other services that we can provide and do provide for our creators are just a nice way to help uh, towards that same goal. That's great. I love that you guys kind of customize what you offer for your creators based on their needs. And I think that really highlights the need for creators to understand what they want to get out of the partnership before they go into it and know what to ask for and know what they need. Before we get into the Q&A, I would love to just hear from each of the panelists on your tips for best practices on kind of overall creating a sustainable and successful podcast that brings fulfillment to both the creator and their audience. So Mike, let's go ahead and start with you. Sure, uh, it's another great question. Um, I find the podcast creators that succeed, uh, for one, they have a really strong voice in a POV, uh, as well as storytelling capabilities, something that uh, all of you guys as creators, I'm sure you all have and will be able to bring to this new medium. I'd also call out that it does take a uh, certain level of commitment um, there's a hilarious stat in podcasting that it's something like 1% of podcasts, new podcasts only make it past the first eight episodes. Um, I think a lot of people don't realize the amount of time it takes to going into making a podcast. I'm sure that Steven and Rebecca know more <laughs> well than most uh, how much effort it takes to make, not only make a podcast, make a good podcast. Um, so I just make sure that you, you know, know that going into it. Um, I'd also call out that I think is interesting to see a lot from digital creators is that I know that as a creator, sometimes you get locked into a certain type of content, a certain type of audience on platforms, um, especially with, you know, the algorithms deciding what gets served to people and they kind of want to keep serving that same thing that's popular. And I've heard from a lot of digital creators that podcasting offers an opportunity for them to lean to a new format uh, in a lot of ways, sometimes even age up their audience that they haven't been able to in the past. Uh, so definitely something that you want to think about when you look to start a podcast that I think will help you in being successful. Absolutely. Really great advice. Rebecca, let's go ahead and kick it to you. Um, so to, to Mike's point, I did try to record my own podcast a couple, couple months ago and, and failed very well at it. Um, so it definitely is a commitment and it's challenging. Um, so that said, what I would say is, you know, have a defined structure and a through line from episode to episode and a theme that is going to resonate um, with your audience beyond that 30 minute listening session. People need to take something away with them so they can apply their learnings to, to life. Um, remember that there are thousands of podcasts out there all vying for people's attention and time. So how do you make your podcast worth their time? Always keep that in mind. Um, and then I think at the end of the day, one of the most important things is really connecting with your audience and connecting with other podcasters and working really, really hard. Again, I'm going to say that reach out and collaborate with other creators, just like you do on YouTube and just like you do on Instagram. All of that work needs to apply to the podcast space as well. That is how you will grow your audience. So at the end of the day, this is really an ecosystem that we're building and working together works to everyone's benefit. It doesn't need to be about competition. Um, and then lastly, you know, I will reiterate this um, as well. Nothing replaces great storytelling. Um, make sure you're saying something that's worthwhile and that you're telling a good story. Great advice. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Uh, lastly, let's go ahead and hear from Steven. Yeah, I mean, great advice from both of you on that one. Uh, I feel like you stole my answers, but I'll, I'll, I'll just add to it is like the, the thing I think a lot of times people um, fear in podcasting or creating content is sometimes it's like, I don't wanna get too narrow or I don't wanna get too specific about what I do. And I sort of feel the opposite. Like if there is, if you can get a little bit narrow, if you can be a very defined in the way that your podcast, what it's trying to achieve, maybe the segments that you have week over week, um, the type of jokes that you make even, like if you can kind of narrow it down a little bit, I actually think it makes the whole podcasting thing easier because 
what I find is when you kind of you're dealing of the blank page of the podcast and you can talk about anything and you can go anywhere, um, it gets it gets a little tricky and daunting. Um, and instead, if you go like every episode, we start with a hot take or um, a piece of news that we, we heard and we want to dissect from our point of view or whatever. I think that those little building blocks to a show can make it easier to continue. And I think it makes it fun for the audience to know what they're expecting week over week and go like, oh, this is the thing. And last last bit of it, again, just to talk about format and being uh, a weird robot who's rigid sometimes, uh, it also invites new listeners, right? Like if you're 300 episodes deep, which sometimes I've worked with podcasts that are that far in, if you're, you know, inside reference land and we're not even going to mention what the podcast is about and like, you know, all, they're all crazy. It's really, really hard to bring on new listeners because they're like, what is this about? I don't get it. Uh, so I'm very big on embracing the format and truly join the community. It's a, it's a great place. I think podcasters as a, a whole are fun to chat with. Uh, and yeah, it's a good place to be. I think that's great advice. And those those rituals that appear in every episode and in that structure, not only in podcasts, but also on all platforms in YouTube and in Instagram really makes people feel like they're part of that community. They know what to get when they're going into the podcast. And I think especially for someone who's just starting out on a podcast, finding that niche is a great way to start that early growth. 100%. So I like to think of it as like a late night television show almost like nobody gets mad that Jimmy Fallon has two guests in the a band, right? Like it's just a format and it really helps everybody come back week mm -hmm. after week and discover the show. Absolutely. Let's go ahead and jump into the Q&A. Anyone who is watching this, feel free to send in your questions and we will answer as many as we can in the next 15 minutes or so. Uh, let's go ahead and start with this question. How can you gain listeners for your podcast if you don't have a lot of followers on social media? Uh, Mike, do you want to go ahead and answer this one? Yeah, I would just echo um, what Rebecca and Stephen both said. I still think that the best tried and true method of building audience is to do cross promo on other podcasts. So just like the same way you do on YouTube, collabing with other creators, um, I would highly encourage you guys to do that, uh, especially if you don't have, you know, audience through other means. I think that's the best way to build an audience for a podcast. Mm -hmm. Great advice. Anyone else have anything they want to add before we go to the next question? I would just very quickly, again, add to that is like, make the podcast really good. Be a guest on other podcasts. Don't worry about building up your social media or your website. I think that's a secondary concern to creating a great podcast that has an audience. Focus on making a really good show and telling people, hey, this is what the show is. It's really great. Like I said, spoil the best parts of it and you'll be on a good path. Awesome. Rebecca, question for you. Um, what do you need to do to get on those new and noteworthy lists on podcast platforms? Um, so for independent podcasters who might not be working with a partner at the moment, um, if you go into your Apple Connect portal using your Apple ID, um, you should be able to, to, to pitch yourself to Apple. There's a form that you can fill out. Um, you have to write up a bio for yourself, a show description, um, and really tell them what about your show is unique and why they should feature you. If you're working with a partner like Acast, um, we can facilitate that for you. We can pitch for you. And additionally, we're having conversations with, with Apple and various partners um, and bringing you know, our important partners to the forefront um, so that Apple's keeping them top of mind for these features. Sometimes you have to pitch yourself a few times. It doesn't always happen right away. Um, but if you, if you keep at it, um, hopefully Apple will pick it up one day. Great advice. And you know what? It doesn't hurt to fill out that form. That's the thing. You could, can put yourself out there, fill out the form, fill it out again and again and again. <laughs> yep, so exactly. Steven, a question for you. What analytics should creators be collecting to share with potential advertisers? Yeah, great question. The first thing any advertiser will likely ask is what's your audience size or how many downloads do you get per episode? Um, so having a good picture of that is pretty easy. Uh, the other things like demographics for age, gender, 
those are helpful. And if you have a very specific niche or maybe interest uh, for your podcast that people are into, um, let's say you're doing a, a body positivity podcast or you know that type of thing, uh, telling that to an advertiser might help them realize like, oh, this is a really good brand fit for me. Um, and then beyond that, it's not too much more. I think podcasting doesn't need to get overly analytical. They like working with great creators who have good audiences. Great advice. Another audience question coming in here. Um, let's let's do this one for Mike. Mike, how are um, or sorry, what is the longest that you think creators should be making their podcast? Is there a cap where the audience really starts to trickle off? It's a great question. Um, I think it really depends on the content and the format. Um, there are some shows that you know are daily shows that last only 15, 20 minutes. There are some shows that are more on the mic that last you know 90 minutes, two hours. Uh, I think it just depends what makes sense for your show and your audience. Um, what is good news is that a lot of analytics platforms, including now Spotify for podcasters, will actually allow you to see episodic retention throughout the episode. So you can actually see when people are starting to drop off. Um, so you can use that to optimize and figure out what exactly is the best length for your podcast episode. That's great that you guys have that because I use that tool all the time in YouTube analytics where it'll show you the dip and I'm like, why did so many people click off here? And you know, then I look at it and the, the audio was messed up or the frame was bad or it was just a, a boring part that dragged on a little bit. And that data is super valuable for crafting future episodes and making them more engaging. Uh, Rebecca, a question for you. How are podcast networks approaching production resources for creators amidst the COVID-19 pandemic? Um, interesting question. Um, I would say, well, at ACAST, sometimes we don't handle production, to be honest. Um, oftentimes, a lot of the creators we work with are are independent and they work with an outside producer or they edit their own podcast themselves. Um, so I would say that, you know, during COVID, we actually saw an influx of new podcasts being generated on our ACAST open platform. So from my perspective, I would say production wasn't quite affected. Um, you know, if we are doing investment in projects, um, obviously that's, there's like a, a whole, contract that needs to, to come into play here. Um, it's something that, that, you know, people are starting to do again, I think. Um, and the one thing that, that I would say about the podcast ecosystem is that um, while there might have been a moment in which advertisers weren't spending as much, for the most part, listens were steadily increasing um, during that period of time. People weren't in cars listening anymore, but people were at home cleaning their houses, you know, puttering around and listening to podcasts. So, I'd say we were kind of remained quite strong. Absolutely. And the great thing about podcasts is it is a pretty low barrier to entry to get started. You can record mm -hmm. it in your house. You can, I, I have a friend who has a podcast and records it in her closet because the acoustics are best in there. And there are so many ways that you can get around the production issues that come up with COVID. Um, a question for Steven. How does the type of podcast that you make affect the distribution? Oh, that's a good question. Um, and honestly, I'm not sure I fully understand it, but uh, I'm just gonna go off the cuff and see if I can put together something. Uh, <laughs> podcasts are welcome everywhere, just in general. Uh, I don't think any type of genre or uh, subject matter is typically blocked on any podcast platform like Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, the list goes on. I don't think that's really the case. I think the only thing that I would say is if you're talking specifically about a video podcast, which if you are, please clarify, this would be helpful. Um, there are like limited distribution op options there. You can distribute your podcast as a video through Apple Podcasts. Actually, Mike, I'm not even 100% sure if it's open for Spotify to do it, but some podcatchers will actually take the video version. Um, but I think most of all these days, if people are releasing a video podcast, it makes a lot more sense to do it on YouTube or Facebook or IGTV, something like that. 
And do you think when a creator is doing a video podcast and they're putting it on YouTube, should they also be putting the audio version um, on all the the audio platforms through a um, host platform? Yeah, I I say get your podcast everywhere. Um, if you're like me, you know I've been listening to podcasts for a long time. Uh, I have one specific app that I will use for listening to my podcast, and no other apps. Uh, so there's a few of us purists out there who have a really strong opinion about apps, and I'm I'm sure you some of you feel that way too. When you have something you love, you don't want to change it. So get it out as wide as possible. It won't hurt your monetization options. It won't hurt your analytics. Uh, it won't be it won't have any real downside at all. Very, very good point. When I launched my podcast, I thought that the vast majority of the views would come from YouTube since that's where my audience is. Um, But I put it on all of the podcast platforms, just figuring, you know, everyone will be able to see it. Maybe a couple people will watch it on here. And I was shocked that it was about 50-50 of audio listeners versus YouTube listeners. And if I hadn't put my podcast on those audio platforms, we would have been missing out on a huge subset of our podcast audience. So I definitely agree with that. Put your podcast everywhere you can. Get it in front of as many people as you can. Uh, One more audience question, unless we get a couple more in. So audience, feel free to send in your questions. Uh, What is the sweet spot for episode downloads for an advertiser to want to buy against your podcast? Does anyone want to jump in on that one? I have a thought. Uh, Yeah, go, Rebecca, you go. You can go. I'll go. Then you Uh, do. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. um, I would say it really varies from genre to genre because sometimes you can have a very niche podcast, perhaps about yoga that gets, I don't know, 10,000 listens a week or so. Um, And they'll be completely sold out because there's not too much going on in that genre. And the content's really good, of course. Um, But then I think, you know, as as more podcasts enter the ecosystem, um, it it does become harder and harder to grow an audience and to entice advertisers to sign on. So there is a threshold um, at which advertisers tend to be compelled to to spend more. Sometimes we're seeing that's above 20,000 listens a week for a podcast. It's not a hard and fast rule at all. It, it really varies, as I said. And then, of course, if you're open to running more programmatic pre-recorded ads on your show, you can start seeing that coming in right away. Um, you don't have to reach a, a certain threshold for those at all. 100% agree with all of that. Uh, the 20,000 rule I've heard many times before, and it's a very soft rule. We've monetized uh, podcasts at lower rates than that. Um, it's, it's really just build a great podcast with a great audience. I want to tell one quick story, which was I met somebody who does a podcast all about a very specific type of industrial plumbing. And they had like 25 <laughs> listeners an episode, no joke. And they made more money. They were telling me how much money they made. They made more money on those 25 listeners than I know people who have like 100,000 listeners make. Uh, so if you have a very niche thing, you can monetize. <laughs> Right. It's not always about the number of people in the audience, but, you know, how is that audience connecting to your content and are they passively listening? Are they actively listening? Are they part of this community? One last audience question. What's better for a podcast, a pre-recorded audio ad or a host delivered message? And I'll open that up to all three of you, whoever wants to jump in. Um, I think I, I honestly, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I think it can be either uh, a podcast. Uh, do do the ads that fit into your podcast. Some people don't feel very good about uh, programmatic or pre-recorded ads. Uh, some people actually really need to do it like journalists. Uh, sometimes there's a mm-hmm. conflict of interest of a journalist reading advertising. Um, so do the do the ads that fit your episode and fit your audience. Yep, absolutely. It's a personal choice. Um, and I think if you're working with a good ad sales company who is able to, to keep the CPMs pretty high for both the host read stuff and, and the pre-recorded programmatic ads, then you're in good shape either way. So it's, it's really about how you want to be connecting with your audience. Great advice. Last thing before we go, I know you all work with a lot of different podcasts, so you may not want to pick your favorite, but do you have a favorite podcast? Oh, geez. <clears throat> I have a bunch. I'm happy to speak to this. Um, Go for it. Let's see. 
Most recently, um, I don't know if you guys will see the nice white parents, uh, but it's incredible. Uh, I would also check out, um, I just did a big road trip and most of it I spent listening to Pushkin's Deep Cover, which is a crazy good story. Um, more generally, um, I have and always will be a Mark Marin fan. He's what got me into podcasting originally. Uh, I love Marin. Um, some one more I'll say, just because I think it actually kind of shows the possibilities of the medium. Um, you guys listen to Gay Future, uh, the scripted sci-fi comedy show. Uh, it's like an episode of South Park. It's hilarious. I couldn't recommend it enough. And again, it just shows, you know, what actually are the possibilities of this medium. It's not just, you know, educational, true crime, celebrity interview. Um, there's a lot of possibilities with podcasting that I think we're just starting to explore. Awesome. Uh, Rebecca? Um, I would say, uh, I have a few good moms, bad choices is an incredibly funny, hilarious, funny, unfiltered parenting podcast. They share really good advice. I'm not a parent yet, but maybe one day I'll turn to them for advice. Um, pantsuit politics. Um, they share a nuanced approach to news and politics. Uh, it's hosted by two women and it is just incredibly uh, sensitive conversations around what's going on in the world today. I think we all need to stay informed. Um, and then lastly, I'm a huge fan of Terrible Thanks for Asking, uh, hosted by Nora McInerney. She's just an amazing storyteller and an amazing interviewer, and I am hoping that podcast will come back very soon. Uh, so those are my top three. Awesome. I'll have to check all of those out. Steven? I'm gonna list a couple of standbys, which I think everybody knows, like This American Life, 99% Invisible, Radio Lab, Freakonomics. They're all really great podcasts and still very popular. And I think one reason why that sounds a little silly is there's still not a ton of really great podcasts. There's a lot of podcasts, but there's not a ton of great ones. So I say there's always room for podcasters. Also, I just have to shout out since it's YouTube uh, VidCon, we have to chat about it. A couple of the podcasters that I work with, Waveform uh, with MKBHD, uh, Wild Till Nine with Lore DIY, both really great podcasts, proud of those. And we got a whole bunch on our network. And I'll, I'll shout out a personal favorite of mine called High and Mighty. It's a comedy podcast on the HeadGum Network where this comedian, John Gabris, uh, just has strong opinions about things and he talks about them with his friends. That's it. That's the whole podcast. It can be as simple as that. And I think it's really good. <laughs> Well, that is so awesome. I have a whole list now of new podcasts to look up and a whole list of notes for exciting things that I want to implement into my podcast in the future. So Mike, Rebecca, and Steven, I cannot thank you guys enough for sharing your knowledge on podcasts with us today. Such a cool experience. I mean, like how often do we get to sit down and have an honest chat with experts from some of the biggest companies in podcasting? And a huge thank you to VidCon for putting this all together and giving us the opportunity to learn and develop our podcast together. So I'm Sierra Schultze. I've been your moderator. Thank you so much for joining us today. I hope you guys all learned some awesome stuff that you can put into your podcasts. And I can't wait to see all the amazing things that you create. Bye, everyone.